Well, with me here in the studio is Giorgio Cafiero. He's the CEO and founder of Gulf State Analytics, a risk consultancy focused on the GCC. Also joining us is Rami Khoury. He's a senior fellow at the American University of Beirut. And completing our panel from Paris is TRT World's editor-at-large, Craig Kapitas. German, thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to start by asking you all the same question. Giorgio, let me start with you. Did Jared Kushner's business dealings affect U.S. policy towards Qatar? There is a lot of speculation that this is the case. However, I'm not sure that there's any evidence which can prove that uh, Kushner's business interests were responsible for the tweets from Donald Trump, which suggested that his administration was supportive of the mm -hmm. blockade of Qatar. Of course, uh, the perception, though, is that this was one of the variables in play. I think this is going to further contribute to a perception that the personal business interests of Trump and those mm -hmm. in his inner circle, rather than the U.S.'s national interests, are shaping Washington's foreign policy right, right now. Right. Craig Kapitas, correlation or causation? Did, what, what's going on? I have no idea. There's no, pr there's no proof. There's just speculation. I think we have to leave it at that. How bad does it look for Kushner, Craig? Or Trump, even? Very bad. No, it looks very bad. It looks very bad for Kushner. Uh, in about one year's time, he has a $1.4 billion debt repayment due on his uh, family's premier property at 666 Fifth Avenue. Uh, $1.4 billion is a lot of money. He's going to have to pay that off. Now, uh, as since he is a New York real estate person, I, I would not be surprised if he asked the Qataris, to the Qatari Investment Fund specifically, to come in and take a piece of that property. I'm sure he's asked a lot of people. But making that connection uh, uh, between that and some policies he may be involved in in the White House is still a leap of faith. If he did, he will go to jail mm -hmm. because doing that is illegal. Rami Khoury. Did Kushner ask the Qataris for money when they said no, U.S. policy towards Qatar changed and they joined and supported the blockade? That seems to be the timeline that some people believe. Do you believe it? Or is there, according to, just as the other two gentlemen said, is there not enough evidence to suggest that at this moment in time? Well, there's certainly, I agree, not enough evidence to be sure about it, but there certainly is overwhelming evidence to suggest that there probably was some link not only between Kushner's financial dealings with foreign countries, the UAE and Qatar and others, China and other places, and uh, he's, he's been involved with people in mm -hmm. Russia, and, uh, but also there's a triangle that goes to American uh, donors who give lots of money to Trump or the Republican Party or a very right-wing pro-Israeli, pro-Likudnik, uh, right-wing uh, supranationalist Zionist groups. Uh, and it's a very mixed web because you also now have the UAE and Saudi Arabia both being applauded at the APEC conference. APEC is the leading pro-Israel registered lobby in the United States. Very right-wing, uh, Likudnik supports Netanyahu. They're now um, openly welcoming the UAE and Saudi policies. So it's a much wider web than simply right. did he ask for money and not get the money and support the blockade. That evidence is pretty strong uh, uh, in many, many spheres. Yeah, so let's grab onto that wider web. Giorgio, the BBC obtaining leaked emails that show a lobbying effort, right, to get Rex Tillerson Mm -hmm. fired. So there's this back and forth between this lobbyist and Emiratis and they call Tillerson a tower of jello and weak mm -hmm. and they, he needs to be slammed and so on because he was seemingly soft on the Qataris. So if we, can we include that in this basket of things that we're talking about? And if we can, what does that suggest? Certainly. When Trump became president, I think there were many countries around the world which saw a leader who was extremely inexperienced 
a leader who did not have a deep understanding of global affairs whatsoever. They saw the Trump presidency as an opportunity to use their leverage with the administration, the members of the administration, to shift uh, Washington's approach to the region in ways that would be suitable to their interests or their perceptions of their interests. And I think this UAE opposition to Tillerson really underscores that point. And Tillerson really represents the traditional U.S. diplomatic establishment's view that all six GCC countries are important allies of the U.S. And there was a hope in Abu Dhabi that the Trump presidency could result in America conducting more of an anti-Qatar mm -hmm. foreign policy. And there was a view that Tillerson stood in the way and, and was a problem. Yeah, and about eight months on, is it your belief that this whole thing has failed? Trying to isolate Qatar and getting the U.S. on board and so on? Yes. Yeah. That's the short answer to your right. question. A failure, yes. Rami Khoury, the Qatari government officials who visited the U.S. Uh, said that they considered turning over information to special counsel Robert Mueller. And I want to bring him up a little bit later on because I have a, a particularly spicy question to ask Craig Kapitas. But Mueller, they wanted to give him information that demonstrated, according to them, that their neighbors in the Gulf were coordinating with Jared Kushner to hurt Qatar. My question is, if that is true, why the hell didn't the Qataris actually give it to him? It's hard to tell. They might want to um, try to be downplaying this f problem now because the Qataris feel that they've emerged pretty much victorious. I mean, not victorious, but they've emerged pretty unscathed from this boycott from uh, last June until now. The IMF just issued a a report or a statement saying that the Qataris are in pretty decent shape. Uh, and obviously what the Emiratis and Saudis uh, with the Bahrainis and Egyptians tagging along on their financial coattails, what they did is to uh, try a, a, har a um, hardball move and it failed. It failed miserably. And they've failed in other places in Yemen and Lebanon and Palestine. And every place they've tried, the Emirati-Saudi combine have tried using hardball tactics without success. And, and the Qataris feel that they're in good shape and maybe they wanted to downplay this uh, situation right now. I, I don't know the exact details, <coughs> but we'll have to wait for them to, uh, to, to explain it further. But, it's, but the, the reality is that it's not just a bilateral uh, issue. There are many uh, angles to this, uh, these relationships. Um, and it's, it's a question of uh, foreign uh, financial dealings influencing American foreign policy uh, decisions. There's also ethical considerations purely within the American constitutional uh, system. Uh, there's just a whole range of problematic issues. And Kushner obviously is probably on the way out he and his wife now, because they've not only given the uh, appearance of being unethical, they haven't been indicted. We have to give them the benefit of the doubt. But they've not just given the appearance of being unethical, but they've uh, Kushner has shown stupendous incompetence in what he's done, at least in the Middle East. Uh, and I, the U.S. is so isolated now, a 14 to 1 vote against the U.S. and the Security Council. So you've got these really bad track records from Kushner's right. activities around the world, just on the front of his, his responsibility. Craig Kapitas, all of this Kushner stuff coming as part of the collection of news regarding Robert Mueller's probe. Now, when you look at the genesis of the probe, the probe is about Russia. It's about where the collusion occurred. So is Robert Mueller biting off more than he can chew? Has there been mission creep here? Because suddenly we're talking about the Qataris and real estate deals. What happened to the Russians? Why is he doing this? Well, I don't think it's mission creep. I think, I think the special uh, counsel is, is coming to grips with actually something that you just mentioned. You mentioned coordinating to hurt Qatar. I think the question that Mueller and others are looking at right now is, is the Trump administration has it and does it continue to coordinate to make money? That's what's going on here. The backdrop to this, I think, is exceptionally important. Today, no group in America feels comfortably dominant. Every group feels attacked, pitted against one another, not just for jobs and spoils, but for the right to define America's identity. American democracy, American foreign policy, as we once knew it, is now a zero-sum group competition. And in that type of environment, opportunities for avarice, uh, are irresistible. And that's what's going on here 
with Kushner and with Trump. Let me give you a quick example. Just last night, um, ProPublica reported that uh, one of Trump's golf courses was trying to get team markers with the presidential seal embossed on them. That is illegal, mm -hmm. and uh, you can go to jail for six months of, for that. The Trump, Trump came to the White House with one goal in mind, to monetize the presidency. And I believe, or at least claim to believe, that Robert Mueller is now recognizing that, and that's where his investigation is going. It's not collusion. He's not a Manchurian president, Donald Trump. They went to the White House to make money. Where And as president of the United States, the opportunities for that avarice and corruption, as I said, are irresistible and perhaps inevitable. So, Giorgio, if true, I mean, this is cataclysmic, right? Not only for the presidency, but for the very notion of U.S. democracy and who's in charge. Is it plausible that this presidency is both trying to make money and bring about peace in the Middle East and... Uh, ideally, both at the same time. I think this president has a number of objectives in the Middle East, um, without a doubt, uh, securing lucrative uh, transactions for the United States is one of them. Of course, pushing back Iran is another, supporting the state of Israel, specifically its extremely right-wing and racist government, another moving part. Um, I'm not so sure that the policies of this administration um, tell us that, uh, that Trump is super committed to uh, promoting peace in the Middle East. I think it's more interested in those other three interests I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Rami Khoury, trust in the United States right now. What is it? March 2018. There wasn't a whole lot of trust under President Obama. Certainly no trust under George W. Bush or very little. Within the Middle East, wherever you stand, whether you're sort of on the sort of Ira Iran axis or the Saudi axis or whatever... Do people in the Middle East trust the United States and what they're doing? What's happened in the Middle East, as has happened in um, actually many parts of the world, including in the United States, there's been a massive polarization of societies. And what's happening in the, in the region, including Iran, Israel, Turkey, and then all the Arab world, um, you have large numbers of the majority of people don't trust the United States now under Trump's leadership. They still have huge respect and affection for American values, but the political leadership of the United States and its foreign policy, uh, they see as problematic, as infantile, as dangerous. Um, they ha so there's been a massive decline in how the majority of people in the region see the United States, except for small pockets of people in, the leadership, in some leadership positions, like the UAE, like Saudi Arabia, uh, like the right wing of the Israeli government, and a few other places. And these are the people who are desperately trying to have close personal relationships with the American president, not with the American system, but with the American president. And, and what you're having now is the uh, process that has been going on in the Middle East for the last 40, 50 years is now starting to happen in Washington, which is family-run mm -hmm. national governance. Uh, and and it's, it doesn't work in the Middle East. The Middle East is a mess because of this, especially because military men took over and had no idea how to run countries. They just ran them into the ground. Look at Egypt, look at Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, every one of them. And now it's happening in the United States. Uh, the difference is the United States is a country unique in the world in many ways that is based on an ideal, not on a shared national heritage, but people came from everywhere, created the system based on the rule of law. Trump is saying, no, it's not based on the rule of law. It's based on the rule of the will of the family and the well-being of the family and its business partners and its crony capitalist friends. There's a struggle in the U.S. now to push back against this. There's a struggle in the Middle East to push back against the people in the Middle East to do this. But I think that's the answer, that there's very small pockets who love Trump and the majority uh, look at him with disdain and fear. Sounds like the Middle East invaded America and imposed autocracy and a ruling family here. Craig Capitas, final word to you in less than 30 seconds, please. I just got back from the United States, from uh, the state of Florida, where I had an opportunity to spend some time with some members of Mar-a-Lago, which is where the real financial 
power of the Trump administration lies. And what these individuals told me a, on a background basis was that the Trump administration has essentially washed its hands of the Middle East. Let them deal with it over there. We don't want any part of it. If we can make some money out of it, that's fine. But the Middle East is the Middle East problem. If Russia wants to get bogged down there, fine, well, and good. If there's a problem, the Israelis will go in and blow the hell out of Iran. That's what they're saying. Whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and consistent with the idea that America is just unwinding its operations there and focusing elsewhere. Gentlemen, it's been a fascinating discussion with all of you. Good to pick all of your brains. Giorgio Cafiero, Craig Capitas, and Rami Khoury. Thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers.